at least three Pauls, and the real Paul was a radical. That book is called The First Paul, reclaiming the radical visionary behind the church's conservative icon. Its authors are the noted scripture scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan. Today, Marcus Borg joins us from Portland, Oregon. Welcome back to Interfaith Voices, Marcus Borg. Thank you. Very nice to be with you again. All right. Now, first, Marcus, why should anyone care how many Pauls there are or what his message says? One reason, of course, is that Paul is the most important theologian in the history of Christianity. I don't mean that he's more important than Jesus, but Jesus was not really a theologian. He was a teacher, a teller of short stories and remarkable one-liners. Uh, so Paul is the earliest Christian theologian, and his ideas have very much shaped Christianity. Now, in addition to that is the reason you mentioned in your introduction. There are some very oppressive passages in letters attributed to Paul, oppressive to women, oppressive to slaves, uh, passages that um, encourage everybody, as you mentioned, to be subject to the governing authorities. And it's really important to realize that those passages come from letters that were written in Paul's name, but that the majority of scholars think were a generation or two after Paul by somebody trying to tone down Paul or to tame the radicalism of Paul. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just because many of those passages have been seen as sacred scripture by Christians for centuries, it's important to realize they're very, very different from the authentic voice of Paul. Uh, now, there are 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament, and you say he wrote only seven of them. What makes you think that Paul did not write all the letters that have his name on them? There are two reasons. One is literary style is very, very different in the six letters that we think don't go back to Paul from what it is in the seven letters that seem to be from the authentic Paul or the first Paul. The second reason is historical situation. Um, first and Second Timothy and Titus in particular seem to reflect a historical setting of around the year 100, developments that had certainly not occurred while Paul was alive, such as rules for who can be a bishop and so forth. And that certainly was not going on as early as the lifetime of Paul. Mm -hmm. And let me mention that these conclusions were reached long before scholars were, let's say, trying to get rid of the passages unfavorable to women or whatever. So ideological considerations like we don't like these passages about women were not part of that uh, conclusion that these are not from Paul. Uh, now, do we know who wrote those other six letters? We don't. Um, somebody writing in Paul's name... Let me add immediately that modern people are likely to think of this as um, forgery right. or as something um, utterly illegitimate. So it's important to add that in the ancient world, including the world of um, Judaism and early Christianity, it was very common to write a document in the name of a revered figure. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much about trying to pretend that you're somebody that you're not. It was, though, about claiming the authority of that figure. Mm -hmm. So it was but fairly in, common mm -hmm. in the ancient world to do something right. like that. All right. Now, you say that the authors of these other six letters were trying to change the radical message of the real Paul to make mm -hmm. his teachings acceptable in the culture of the Roman Empire of that day. Why would they right. want to do that? Well, let me put it this way. The communities, early Christian communities, that the authentic Paul, the real Paul, the first Paul created, were extraordinarily egalitarian communities. Mm-hmm. 
equality between men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, a Christian master could not own a Christian slave, and so uh, slavery within Christian communities was abolished. And this put these communities at real loggerheads with the dominant conventions or cultural mores of the time. It may have prevented some people who were interested in becoming part of these communities from doing so because it was too radical a change for them. I think we see the same thing in the history of almost every new religious movement. It begins with an intensity of an alternative vision and then its boundaries get softened and kind of blurred as the decades and mm -hmm. centuries go by. Mm -hmm. And, of course, within Christianity, uh, this process uh, took four or five centuries, really, mm -hmm. before Christianity simply became identified with dominant culture. Was Paul anti-homosexual? How do you read his message on that issue? The really crucial passage is in the first chapter of his letter to the Romans. Which is part of the authentic Paul, in your it's, definition. It's, it's part of the authentic Paul. It's the passage in which Paul speaks of um, people exchanging the truth about the Creator for a lie, and they began to practice unnatural relations with each other, men with men, women with women, and so forth. Now, what we do with that passage is we note that it's part of a very long list of vices that Paul is citing. You know, he's talking about what the Gentiles are like. And they are idolaters, they are liars, they are gossips, they are fornicators, they are filled with avarice. Their men exchange natural relations with women for unnatural relations with men. So he's piling up a list of typical vices of the Gentile world from a Jewish point of view. This raises the question, does every item in that list matter passionately to Paul? Or is he compiling this long list as a kind of rhetorical flourish to say to his largely Christian Jewish audience in Rome, I share your perception of how evil the Gentile world is. Or, was Paul passionately opposed to homosexuality? It's really difficult to make a judgment between those two possibilities. So then we raise the further question. Suppose we did conclude that Paul was passionately opposed to homosexuality. Should that settle the question for us? Paul was obviously wrong about some things. I mean, even the first Paul, the genuine Paul, was wrong about some things. Paul expected the second coming of Jesus in the very near future, maybe even during his lifetime. He was obviously wrong about that. And so there is the possibility of saying, well, Paul does say this, but you know what? I think he was wrong about the many identities of St. Paul the Apostle. I want to go back to Paul when he was Saul. And he yeah. was a Jew, indeed a Pharisee. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus. Why was he persecuting them? In the very first years, I think it had to be because he perceived the followers of Jesus to be loosening the sharp boundaries between Jew and Gentile. And thus, from Paul's point of view, threatening the very existence, the continuing existence of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, the survival of the Jewish people depended upon their maintaining distinctive modes of behavior and sharp boundaries between themselves and others. Well, now then Paul had this conversion, but you say he was not, as the legend has it, knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus. Right. What actually happened to Paul at his conversion? Um, Paul had what scholars would call a mystical experience, and that's just shorthand for a powerful and dramatic experience of 
the sacred. In Paul's case, according to both Acts and um, and Galatians, he saw a great light, mm-hmm. and he hears a voice that identifies the light as, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now, mystical experiences happen. They're not everyday experiences, but more people have them than we might imagine. Mm-hmm. And once one takes seriously that dramatic experiences like this really happen, it seems clear that uh, Paul had one of these. And did Paul think of himself as a quote unquote Christian after that? He would have thought of himself as a follower of Jesus. He would have thought of himself as living his life in Christ, which means one with Christ and so forth. But the word Christian doesn't come into usage until after the lifetime of Paul. So I think Paul would have thought of himself, did think of himself, as a Jew until his death, a Jew who was a follower of Jesus, uh, a Jew who believed Jesus was the Messiah and so forth. But he did not think of himself as part of a new religion or a different religion. You say that Paul challenged the very paradigm of power in the Roman Empire, namely that religion can support violence that leads to victory and ultimately to peace. And frankly, that sounds familiar to anyone who has heard justifications for all kinds of wars today. But Paul had a radically different model. What was his model? Well, you've correctly identified the central ingredients of Roman imperial theology. Mm -hmm. Roman imperial theology maintained that God had given the rule of the earth to the Roman emperor. And the Roman emperor was spoken of as son of God, Lord, Savior of the world, the one who has brought peace on earth, and, and let so me just forth. let me just interject here. Therefore, when uh, Saint Paul says Jesus is Lord, that's a direct challenge to the Roman Emperor, right? Exactly. exactly. All right. Now, what about this para- his alternative paradigm? The Roman paradigm, of course, was ruling the world through power and the threat of violence and the use of violence. Mm-hmm. The paradigm that Paul found in Jesus and that he advocated himself was what we might call peace through justice, not peace through victory and military power, but peace through justice. And the Roman um, world was radically unjust, and the injustice was maintained by imperial power. Mm -hmm. So the alternative program is work for justice, and justice meant everybody should have enough. It meant food for everybody, Mm -hmm. and it's significant that bread was so important not only to Jesus but to the communities of Paul as well, bread as symbol of the material basis of life. Mm -hmm. And so within these Pauline communities, they were communities of sharing of material resources, as well as spirit-filled communities Mm -hmm. that advocated a very different vision for putting the world together. Now, frankly, your image of Paul uh, came across to me when I read the book like a kind of first-century version of Gandhi or Martin Luther King because you, you emphasize the fact that he wants a just distribution of goods and nonviolence. Right. But this is not the common image of Paul. Why is your interpretation so different? Two comments. First, um, I want to make it clear that even though there are similarities between Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Jesus, and Paul, I don't think we're simply projecting 20th century nonviolence and a passion for justice back on the first century. There were non violent resistance movements within Judaism at the time of Jesus, prior to the time of Jesus. And so this was already there in the Jewish tradition, nonviolent resistance against oppression, including the willingness to be martyred if need be because of what you were standing for. And of course, this passion for justice is at the heart of um, the Jewish Bible, which, of course, for early Christians Mm -hmm. was their Bible. That's right. 
So we see these roots in the tradition itself. And I think one of the reasons that um, many centuries of Christians have missed this, part of it is the political domestication of Christianity that began in the 4th century, with Christianity increasingly becoming the religion of the ruling powers, and so all this material that calls that into question is muted, okay? Mm -hmm. And a, a second reason is what you might call the theologization of Paul, as if his language about justification is really about our individual relationship with God rather than it being about God's passion for a just world. And so Paul really had a kind of theological slash political message there in his advocacy of justice and nonviolence and an egalitarian structure in the early community. Yes, and this was all in the name of God and Jesus. So it was this combination of religion and politics that is so deeply Jewish and deeply Christian when Christianity is most faithful to its roots. Mm. It's also there in Islam, I might add. Finally, how did Paul die? Do we know? The New Testament doesn't tell us anything about his death. Early Christian tradition, probably reliable, reports that he was killed in the persecution of Christians in Rome under the emperor Nero in mm -hmm. the year 64. And uh, what Nero did is he, he blamed Christians for this fire that um, burned down a good portion of the city of Rome in the year 64. And we speculate in the book that Paul and Peter alike, along with many other Christians, were rounded up by Roman authority and put to death, and that Paul probably died as one of a group rather than, you know, being singled out for special martyrdom yeah. or whatever. And it strikes us that that would be so appropriate not Paul dying individually and heroically, but simply as one of a large group of Christians uh, put to death by the Romans in so that great persecution. Even, even in the end, it's likely that he was part of this large egalitarian community that he loved so yeah. much. Yep, and underwent an egalitarian death, if that isn't too strange mm. a phrase to use. And there's so much more in this book that we never even touched in this conversation. And that book is called The First Paul, Reclaiming the Radical Visionary Behind the Church's Conservative Icon. And it's by the noted scripture scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan.